Sorry. Okay. Hi, good day everyone, and welcome to another session of the Ministry of Agriculture. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here to join with us as we share some very important information so that you can have your crops being healthier and also getting that information that you can save money in doing your farming. Now, today you might find the topic that we'll be dealing with may sound a little strange, integrated pest management, pesticide application. We'll also be talking about fertilizer application. But it is very timely in that we are in the dry season and during this time, we have a lot of farming that takes place. So this information is vital. Secondly, insect populations actually increase when conditions are very dry. Therefore, it is timely that we do a session like this. And thirdly, fertilizer application. We know that the price of fertilizers continue to increase. Therefore, it's important that we know a little bit about fertilizers, how to apply them, the correct fertilizers to use, right? So all those are very important and all those are things that we'll be sharing in our session today. Today, I also have my colleague who will be dealing with the fertilizer part, Mr. Jason Ramsaran. So the first part of the session will be on integrated pest management. And in particular, we are going to deal with pesticide application, another very important part of crop production but also very expensive. So we need to know what pesticides to use, when to use it, and most importantly, how to use it. So I'll share my screen and we'll continue. So firstly, this is an outline of what I'll be covering, my part of the session, where we'll be talking about what is a pest. We need to know what is a pest firstly, and then what is integrated pest management. Now, when people hear about integrated pest management, they think it is not using chemicals. Now, the thing is, pesticides are just one part of integrated pest management. You also have cultural, biological, and we will also talk about resistant varieties. Then we'll talk about what really is a pesticide, the types of pesticides, mode of entry, how it is actually getting in, in um, contact with the pests, formulations, and very importantly, label. The label on a pesticide gives you all the information you need to know about the use of this pesticide. We'll also talk about protective gear, very important for your safety, and I will end off my part of the session talking about safety and storage of pesticides. So I invite you to join us for a few minutes. We will try our very best not to bore you and also to keep it short and crisp so you get all the vital information you need to be successful. So the first thing we need to know is what is a pest? A pest is any living thing. It can be a plant, an animal, or even a microorganism that has a negative effect on humans and in plants, especially we are talking about agriculture, right? And this pest could be unwanted plants, like weeds and things like that. It could be fungi, nematodes, microbes such as bacteria, viruses. It can also be insects, spiders, mites, birds, fishes, rodents, even snails, very topical these days. And the reason why they are unwanted or undesired is because they cause havoc, generally speaking. And when we're talking about farming, we are talking about a food source, our food supply, and they cause problems with our food supply, right? It can also be injurious to humans, animals, even while you are tending to your crops and things like that. And also general health. It can also, some could also cause diseases and it also be annoyance, right? And inconvenience to humans. So those are just some examples of why we will consider certain organisms to be pests. Now, getting into integrated pest management referred to as IPM or IPM approaches, it's an ecosystem-based strategy that focuses on long-term prevention of pests or their damage through a combination of techniques. So the key word there, combination. And what is a combination we are talking about? Cultural practices, 
biological control and habitat manipulation, use of resistant varieties, and chemical control, or what do we say pesticides? And in that particular order, if you have a pest problem, most people will run to chemicals or pesticides as the first option. When you can do a number of other practices and you may be able to deal with your pest problem before you resort to a pesticide. So we usually recommend that you do your cultural measures first, then you try some biological one, you incorporate resistant varieties. And should those methods don't should those methods not work, then you resort to the choice of pesticides, which like I say, we'll be stressing a lot on in this session. So when we're talking about cultural practices, it refers to all the measures, all the practices that you need to do to ensure that this plant grows healthy and is able to produce for you and also stand up to your pests and disease pressures. So we start off with land preparation. Let's say you're growing it in the ground or growing media. You are making a mixture and filling in a container and you're going to plant a crop. Certain things you need to have. You need to have proper drainage, aeration, and nutrition, very important, which my colleague will talk about a little later. We will also be, um, you also have to make sure that it has the correct pH or the right pH, and it can hold water, but it could also drain, like we said, drainage. You also need to start off with healthy seedlings or plants in material. Proper spacing. A lot of people, you have a small space or a small container, and you want to try to put a number of things in it. It's very important that you have proper spacing so that air can circulate through the field, so heat doesn't build up to cause multiplication of pests and diseases at a faster rate. Nutrition, and in this case, we're talking about fertilizers, or even if you have, let's say, using organic matter, the correct amounts, the timing, when you should actually do it, the type and the placement, those are very important. Then there are other practices that depend on the crop that you're doing, let's say tomato, for instance, staking, you might have to prune off branches or leaves. There are molding practices, mulching, all things like that. Those not common practices that you need to do to ensure that the plant can stand up to the pest pressures out in the environment. Weed control, very important because they harbor a lot of our, a lot of our pests and diseases ensuring that our crops get full sunlight or enough sunlight because most of our varieties that we have in our country need sun, need sunlight, right? Unless it specifies that it needs semi-shade, you choose to do it that way. Irrigation or moisture, water, any way you want to call it, that is very vital, especially that we are in dry season now. We will have limited water, so we have to know how to use it and how much the plant will need on a daily basis. Intercropping, very important practices as well to reduce pest populations. Managing your pests, so you are, are be able to identify what are your pest issues and then decide how you're going to deal with it. And even when you harvest your produce, how you harvest it and handle it is important and storage. So all those are common practices that we all do, whether we are large scale farmers or we have, uh, have a little kitchen garden, a home garden at the back of our homes. These are practices we need to do to ensure that we have a good quality produce. And they refer to as our cultural practices. Then when we talk about biological control, as the pictures will show here, you actually have one living organism controlling another, and that is IPM. So in this case, you, if you first picture, if you see up there, you will actually see a wasp that is actually destroying um, a larva, right? Or what we refer to caterpillar, the same thing, right? But the correct term is a larva, and it's actually feeding on the larva, right? So that is a way of actually controlling larva. And we will know, for those who know a lot about um, insects, one stage or one of the very destructive stages of an insect is that larval stage, right? They feed on leaves, on our fruits, and things like that. So if you have insects in the environment, in this case, you have your wasp foraging through the fields, picking up this lava or destroying these lavas, they reduce the population. Below there, you have a, a ladybird beetle that is actually feeding on mealybugs, again, reducing its population. So in nature, you have 
organisms or insects that actually manage pest populations and we don't even know it. But when we discriminately use pesticides and we use the wrong pesticides and things like that, we actually destroy the helpful organisms that control the negative ones, right? So we have to be very careful what pesticides we use and when we use them. Now, the third picture on the side here is something that might be not so familiar to many people. What we refer to as the BT product or Bacillus thuringiensis. It's actually a live bacteria that is sold in um, the agro shops. Where, so you just go and you ask for any BT product. And basically what this does, it's, it's a live bacteria that you apply on your plant. Now, it will not do anything harm to your plant. But what happens is when you apply this onto your plant, anywhere you have a larva, that worm again or that caterpillar, that is feeding, it will feed on the leaves, the bacteria will get in the system of the larva, and then the bacteria activates, killing the organism, killing the larva. And that's another way of what we talk about biological control. So you have different methods, different ways of using biological control to your advantage instead of using pesticides. Then, part of IPM is also talking about the varieties, different varieties or resistant varieties. So the picture will show here, when we're talking about resistant varieties, we are talking about within this variety, let's say it's tomato that we are dealing with, a particular variety of tomato will have certain things in it to stand up to pests and disease pressures that you will have in the environment. Whereas you have varieties that are susceptible, meaning that if you plant it, you will get certain pests and diseases coming and attacking it. And then you have tolerance where whether you have the pests or the disease on the plant, it could still stand up to the conditions and also produce for you. Now, why is this important to you? When you go to buy your seedlings or you go to buy your seeds, it's very important that you read up a little bit about the variety. So you know what the variety has in it, and then you choose whether to buy it or another one. And by just doing that, sometimes it might be a little more costly than the other varieties, but in the long run, it could stand up to the pressures out there, pests and disease issues. That is why you choose those varieties. Many large-scale farmers will know like in the rainy season, there are certain varieties of tomato that they will buy compared to the dry season because the conditions are different. You have varieties that can tolerate more wet conditions as compared to varieties that can tolerate more dry conditions. So that's why it's important that you know a little bit about the varieties of plants that you are buying. And then we'll come to the main part of our session today where we're talking about chemical control. And like we say, with chemical control, not that it's not recommended, you use it, but as, as a last resort when you have your pest issues. And you need to know about the chemical before you use it. So the first thing you will want, we will want to know is, what is a pesticide? Very simple terminology. Pesticides are natural or synthetic compounds that can poison and can kill pests, including humans. That is why it's very important, and we'll talk about protective gears in a, a little while, insects, pathogens, weeds, rodents, things like that. It can also be any substance or mixture of substances intended, to prevent, intended for the preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating pests. So generally speaking, a pesticide is used to manage or control pest populations. And like we went through, what are the different pests we are talking about? Now, if you forget all our jargon, basically, just remember, like the word pesticide, the side comes from the Latin word to kill. So anything you put, any word you put in front of side, it means that is what you are going to kill. So for example, when we are talking about an insecticide, it means this pesticide will kill insects. Very simple. When we're talking about a miticide or a caricide, basically it is used to kill 
bites, ticks. When you have a nematode problem, and in other sessions we'll talk about um, more about pests and um, um, describe about different types of pests and how you know what pest is causing your problems, right? If it is a nematode problem, you will use a nematicide, a fungal problem, a fungicide. Herbicide is for weeds, to control weeds. We decide herbicide, they use it interchangeably. A molossicide, again, very topical these days, used to control slugs and snails. So that is a general guide for you to follow when you are going to buy your pesticides. So let's, if it is you have a fungal problem, and you use an insecticide on your plant, it will not work because it was not formulated for a fungus, right? And the reverse goes, if you have an insect problem and use a fungicide, it will not work as well. But there are many people out there who believe once it's a chemical or a pesticide, it will work for anything. That is not true. And this is where you use the chemical in the wrong way. It will not work and you will also be wasting your money and put in too much chemicals in the environment. So it's very important that you know what side you are using to control your problem. So it means you need to know what pests you have, right? Now I have um, captioned there in blue, for those who can see it, there is no pesticide, there is no pesticide that is used for virus. Once a plant has a virus, there is no chemical that will be can be used to control this virus or get rid of the virus. However, when our officers visit you in your fields, in your home garden and things like that, and you have a viral problem, most times they recommend an insecticide. Now you might think they don't know what they are talking about. Now, the thing is, viruses spread from plant to plant by what we call vectors or sucking insects. So let's say you have one plant in your garden that has a virus on it or in it. If you don't do anything about it, insects will feed on your virus plant and spread it to other plants. So when we recommend an insecticide for a viral problem, it is not to control the virus but it is used to control the vectors or those insects that spread the virus further into your field. So hope you got that part, right? So if you have a viral problem, the easiest thing to do is to remove that plant because it is referred to as the inoculum standing there. So it is virus there just standing, waiting to spread. So you remove the virus plant, the affected virus plants, and you apply an insecticide to your field. So should the vectors be around that already has the virus in it, they will not spread it to the other plants. Now, when we're talking about pesticides, there are different groupings, if you want to refer to it as, as that. So you have the synthetic pesticides, which are the man-made ones in the factory that you go to the agro shop and you buy in a pack or a bottle and things like that. You also have the biological ones, and like I mentioned about the BT products earlier, so you have some where you, it is actually good bacteria, good fungi, and once you follow the label, you know exactly how to apply it. So I'll use an example of um, the BT product, Bacillus, that we talk about. It is a live bacteria, and the, the label will tell you you mix it in water and you apply it onto the leaves of your plant. Let's say you take that same Bacillus thuringiensis and you mix it with an insecticide and you apply it to your plants. It will not work. Well, let's say you mix it with a fungicide. It will not work because the directions or the, on the label did not say to mix it with another chemical. More than likely, you will cause some reaction that may kill the live bacteria. And then you will say the BT product is not working. It is not that it's not working. It means you didn't follow the recommendations or the directions on how to use it. So it's always important that you read the label, and we will stress a little bit more about labels again. Read the label and follow the recommendations. So you have biological pesticides, then you have botanical pesticides. And when we talk about botanical, we refer to those that are derived from plants. So a good example is neem. They extract the oils from the neem plant, the leaves, and they make products out of it. 
the active ingredient, when they extract it, will refer to as, um, as a directin. So in, on a label, you will see the active ingredient of a product called as a directin. And that means is the active ingredient came out from the neem plant. So that's a common example. And then you will have your natural pesticides. Those are the ones that didn't get factory processed, if you want to say that. This is where you can find things around your home that you can make together and apply it onto your plants. And they, could re and they are very useful in reducing your pests and disease populations. For some examples like crushing garlic, putting it, applying it in water and placing it on your plants, using wood ash on your plants to reduce diseases and things like that. And in a lot of our um, farmer training courses, we actually talk a lot about these different types of um, pesticides that can be used. So I advise you to actually register for some of the course, these courses uh, so that you can get more information as well. Even on our ministry's website, we have a lot of information on that. So now we know a little bit about pesticides. We know what side means, how to use it. Now we need to know how it actually enters the pests. And we say pests, we remember we refer to pests, disease, weeds, all those, right? So what we refer to as the mode of entry. And some common terminologies that we talk about is contact pesticides, systemic pesticides, translaminar pesticides, translocated pesticides, fumigants. Those are some general ones. And it's always important that you know what the words mean and you know how they work on your plant. So the first one is contact. As the name says, it is only where the chemical gets in contact with the pest. When it gets in contact with the pest, it can actually destroy the pest. So if you look at our picture there, the first diagram, direct contact. It means this pest has to be on the plant and then you apply your contact insecticide let's say it's a lava your contact insecticide the chemical will get in contact with your pest and you will kill the pest however let's say you're talking about things like aphids that feed under the leaves of your plant if it feeds under the leaf of your plant and you're using a contact insecticide and you don't get under the leaves you cannot get in contact with your pests. So you'll be using your chemical, your pesticide, but it will not work for your pest population. That is why you have systemic insecticides or translaminar insecticides. Your systemic insecticides mean you apply it onto your plant and it goes through the entire system of your plant from the tip of the leaf straight down to the root system. You can even apply it as a soil drench in the soil and it moves upwards in your plant. From the root, it goes upwards straight to the tips of your plant. So wherever this pest is feeding, you can actually, it will get the chemical. Once it is actually um, consuming the sap of the plant, it will actually get the chemical and they will die. Now, very important when you're using systemic insecticides, understand the chemical also gets into the fruit or your vegetables. And just now we'll talk about what we call pre-harvest interval, because if you're using chemicals like that, safety is very important. Then when we talk about translaminar, it basically, you put as we um, go down a little later, translaminar meaning you apply it onto your leaf, but it goes through the different layers of your leaf, right? It goes through different layers of your leaf, so it can get to the pest underneath the leaf. Now, when we look at a leaf, we might think it looks thin like a sheet of paper, but it actually is made up of layers, right? Then, when you talk about translocated, as you will see in your picture here, you apply it on top of your plant and it goes down to the root. It doesn't come upwards like the basic systemic types, right? So you have your translocating types and your translamina, as I mentioned, you apply it on top of your leaf, but it is able to penetrate and go downwards into your leaf. So if you have pests feeding underneath the leaf, you actually control them as well. So those are what we call um, how it actually enters the plant and then how it gets in contact with your um, pests. Then you need to know a little bit about the formulation that you are buying. And we talk about formulation, basically the, how it is made up. So you will have what we call emulsifiable concentrates. You will have solutions, you have flowables, you have aerosol. Aerosol is like those sprays. You have dust types, you have granular, you have wettable powder. 
And each one, the recommendation is different in terms of how it is mixed and how it is applied onto your plant or into the environment. That is why it is very important that you read your label. I have in bold here baits because that is also very popular these days. But again, you need to know what bait you are using and how to apply bait, right? Applying bait is not as just simple as how you apply a fertilizer. It is completely different, which I'll touch on a little later. Oh, I actually have it here. Right, so very topical all over social media. I'm sure maybe some of you all may have this issue are in around your community, giant African snail. And a major way, and the easiest way I should say of controlling giant African snail is actually using metaldehyde bait. So metaldehyde basically is the active ingredient in bait. If you can't remember metaldehyde, just go and ask for snail or slug bait. Now, something very important about this bait, it has an attractant in it. What does that mean? It has elements in it that gives off a scent that will attract these snails or slugs. Anywhere they are hiding, they will be attracted and they will come out and feed on bait. Now, if you apply bait in your field, between your plants and things like that, what are you doing? You are encouraging snails or slugs to come into your field and get in contact with your plants which defeats the purpose of what you're trying to do, right? So what you do is when you have bait, very important, you apply your bait along the borders of your field. Very important, right? So that if they are in your field, they come out and they feed on bait. And if on the, they are on the outskirts, they remain on the outskirts. So when you apply your bait, you will get this giant African snail. They will move towards the bait. They will feed on it and then they will die in a few days. Now, what happens with the bait? When they consume the bait, they don't die immediately. So sometimes they feed on the bait, you see them there, and you think the bait is not working. It is not that it's not working. It takes a few days before they die. So very importantly, when you're using snail bait, place bait along the borders of your field or your garden, right? That is how you apply the bait, not in your field or between your plants or not on your plants as well, right? You can also make traps. So you can collect vegetable peelings, vegetable scraps, make little heaps, apply the bait in that heap as well, and put and have these heaps along the borders as well of your field. Snails will come out, they will feed on the bait on the outskirts and they will die. So again, just to stress, and I have it in red there, never apply bait on or in your field. Basically, you are applying it along the borders. And for those who never see exactly what the eggs look like, the picture actually shows it. Little cream to white color eggs. Usually you find them in clusters on the soil. Hardly you will find eggs on your plant, right? Snails lay egg on the soil. And this is what the giant African snail looks like, that brown snail with cream to yellow stripes running in one direction. So you still need to look out for it and you use your bait to manage this problem. Another thing that when we're talking about pesticides, all pesticides have it, this color coding. You will notice this color coding, green, blue, yellow, or red, right? Now the thing with these color codings, they mean something. It means as you move upwards from green moving up to red, it means you need less of the chemical to do more killing. So it means as you move upwards, it is that chemical is more toxic. So in layman terms, when you're going to buy a chemical, this is what you look for. Two chemicals side by side with each other. At the end of the label, you observe that color code. So it's in what, the first one, you will see that yellow band. The second one, you will see the green band. So now you know which one is more toxic than the other. All pesticides are toxic, some form, some fashion, right? But the synthetic ones, they're actually labeled in a certain way like this so that you know which one is more toxic than the other. You try to use the less toxic ones, right? Above in the one with the green label, if you observe, you will see it says it's a systemic bacteria side and a fungicide. So again, you are reading, we are reading our label. So it says it's systemic and it is used to control or manage bacteria and also fungi. 
if you apply this for insect problems or snail problems, obviously it will not work. So the label tells you everything. And should you be using pesticides and you observe any of these symptoms, you need to seek um, immediate medical help assistance because it could be that you, some form, some fashion, you may have um, gotten poisoned by the use of your pesticide. So you will have mild poisoning and you can have moderate poisoning as well. So it's something to take into account when you're using pesticides. That is why in every session, every course that the ministry does, we stress on protective gears. Classical thing, someone is applying a pesticide, whether it's a weedicide, a fungicide, whatever it is, no form of protection, right? That is crucial when you are dealing with your pesticides. Just to illustrate here, this is something, what we talk about, the human body has hot spots. And if you look at where the red spots are, it's at the genital area and your face, your head area. Those are the two areas that absorb chemicals or absorption takes place the fastest, right? You also have the other pink points where it can also get into your system. So it's very important that these areas are protected or covered and to prevent pesticides from getting into your system. So basic protective gears, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Normal thing, you need to have a hat in this case is not only for protection for pesticide, but also for the heat and things like that. We are in the dry season. A respirator is very important so you don't inhale the chemicals and also our goggles so that drift doesn't get into your eye. Long sleeve clothes, boots, an apron when you are mixing your chemicals. All those things are very important to protect your body when you are handling, mixing, or applying your pesticides. And very important terminologies, as I wind up my part of the session, active ingredient, that is very important. That is actually the part that does the killing. Drenching, when we talk about drenching, we, it refers to soaking and you, you usually drench the soil. Let's say you have a soil-borne problem. When you hear the term foliar, and my colleague will talk about foliar fertilizers, you also have foliar pesticides. It means you apply it onto the leaves of your plant. When we talk about pre-emergent pesticides, basically it means you apply it before you plant your crop or before the weeds emerge and things like that because it kills weed seeds. Then we talk about very important pre-harvest interval. Sometimes you see the word pre-harvest interval. Sometimes you see PHI. It means the same thing. And what does that mean in layman terms? It's a period of time when you, it is safe for you to pick and consume the crop or the vegetable, whatever you want to call it, after pesticide was applied to the plant. You do not pick the produce and put it down there and say the pesticide will work out from the system of the plant. There's a particular period of time when you should, it is safe for you to pick it after you use a chemical. And the label again tells you all that. So we have an original label here on a pesticide bottle, so it explains everything in pictorial form. So the first thing is the type of chemical. So it is saying this particular one, it's an insecticide and a nematicide. So it means it will control insect problems and also nematode problems. It mentions the active ingredient, which is as a directing. And we always recommend you don't use the same active ingredient over and over. If you do that, your pest will develop resistance or tolerance to it. So you always rotate your active ingredients. It also, at the end there, you are seeing the color code, which is green in this case. On the label, it also tells you the pest it is used to control, the crops you can apply it on, the rate or the dosage, very important. You follow what the rate says. If it says one teaspoon, in this case, it says one to three mLs per liter of water. You follow the rates. Going outside the rate or changing the rate does not mean the chemical will work better. It actually does the opposite. And in this chemical, it says the pre-harvest interval is none. It means I can apply the chemical today and consume, pick and consume the produce tomorrow, right? But it, sometimes you have days. So let's say, for example, it says the pre-harvest interval is seven days. It means it takes seven days from when you apply the chemical onto your plant before it is worked out of the system of your plant. So it would mean that you should harvest your produce in eight days time. 
so that you're sure there is little or no residues of pesticide in your produce. And it also shows protective gears again. Very important about storage, where you are storing your pesticides, you do not store it among your food supply. So in this case, I don't know you, if you can find where the pesticides are. First one, striking, glaring there, systemic fungicide. Then you have a sodium chlorate, chloride, a weedy side, among your cornflakes and your oils and things like that. You never want to store your pesticides where you have your food stuff. Very important. Pesticide should not be stored up in your house. It should be stored on the outside and it should be protected with a lock so that if you have children and things around that they don't come in contact with it. It should be stored in the, its original container. So you're not going to pour anything into a soft drink bottle and have it anywhere. You're supposed to store it in cool temperatures and the label tells you how you can store it. And when you are finished with your pesticides, it's always important that how you dispose your containers. So let's say it's a plastic container, you're supposed to rinse it, triple rinse it, place that rinse water in your spray can and spray it back into your field or into a safe area. And then you're supposed to make holes in that container and send it in the garbage so that no one will take that container and use it for, let's say, filling water and things like that. Usually if it's a bottle, you try to break the bottle. So again, that no one will use it. Very important, if you are breaking a bottle, you need to wrap it in newspaper before you send it in the garbage, right? You don't want that to be a, um, a, a hazard for someone who is dealing with garbage. And finally, as we um, summarize when we talk about pesticides, now we can go on and on about pesticides, but like we say, we are trying to keep it as crisp as possible. What you need to do, firstly, you need to identify the type of pest problem you're having and where is this pest attacking your crop, right? Very important, how much the pest is attacking the crop, where it is attacking your crop. You need to read your label. Your label has all the information you need on how to use this pesticide. Follow the rates, follow the pre-harvest interval. And very important, use your protective gears when handling, mixing or applying your pesticides and storing your pesticides safely. Always remember, you are not going to just broadcast pesticides like terminology you use, read the label and they tell you exactly how to apply them. Whether you apply them on the borders, and we mentioned our um, bait using a giant African snail, where you apply it on your borders and not in your field. So I will now pass you over to my colleague who will talk a little bit about fertilizer applications. Hello everybody, my name is Jason Amsaran. I am an Agricultural Officer 1 Acting at the Ministry of Agricultural Land and Fisheries. Today we are going to be speaking about fertilizer application. So to begin, what is a fertilizer? Now a fertilizer is any material that is applied to either your soil or to plants to provide nutrients that are essential for plant growth and production. If you apply the fertilizer to your soil, it is going to be taken up through the roots and wherever you apply fertilizer to the foliage of your plant or to the leaves of your plant, they are then absorbed and translocated within the plants. You can find fertilizer either of organic sources or inorganic sources. Generally, uh, fertilizers are available either as a solid or as a liquid form and where they are available in solid forms, usually they, they are found as granules, which is probably the most common ones. You can also find them as crystals and pearls. Pearls are similar to granules, except they are much smaller in particle size. And um, liquid fertilizers are usually found in concentrates and they need to be diluted in water. And it is important to, just as Rishi mentioned with the, with the pesticides, to follow the reactions on the, on the label in terms of the dosage and the dilution rate for any um, concentrated chemical or fertilizer. 
So how do we apply fertilizers? We can apply fertilizers using different methods. Some of these are broadcasting, band placement, ring placement, spot placement, semicircle application, foliar application, and fertigation. So just very briefly, we'll be going through um, these methods of application. So for broadcasting, this method of application is more suitable for crops that have a very close um, spacing. So crops such as rice, sugarcane, and if you grow pasta grasses, broadcasting is suitable for this application. It is not the most recommended uh, method for vegetables for a number of reasons. One is if you are broadcast your fertilizer and it gets on top of your plant, wherever it comes in contact, you could have a phytotoxic reaction taking place or what we normally call burning taking place. So you can burn your plants by broadcasting fertilizer on top of your plants. Then you do get a lot of wastage taking place because when you scatter the fertilizer, a lot of it is scattered away from the root zone of your plants. So your plants would not be able to utilize the fertilizer. This would lead to a higher cost of production for you. And also, a lot of times what you're doing is just fertilizing the weeds around your plants and not your plants itself. Then, um, just to mention, there are a lot of negative environmental impacts by um, through the misuse of, of fertilizer. So you can broadcast your fertilizer manually, and this is where you would scatter it by hand, or you can do mechanical broadcasting, and this is where you would use tractors and drones and airplane to do the um, scattering or the broadcasting of your fertilizers. I do have some photos here um, showing the different methods of broadcasting. So you see the manual ones, as well as the mechanical ways in which fertilizers are normally broadcasted. Another method of application is band placement. And this method is suitable for crops that you have a, um, a close space and within rows. So crops such as sweet potato, arrows, corn, um, it's ideal to do band, band placement um, application. And through band placement, the fertilizer is applied in a line or a band on the soil surface. And it is important to take care not to put the fertilizer too closely to the actual plants because you could get that phytotoxic reaction of the burning again taking place. So I have here a photo and this is of sweet potato. And this is one instance in which a band, a band placement method of applying fertilizers would be um, ideal. Um, just looking at the photo on the screen, imagine if you were to do broadcast and fertilizer in this, um, in this crop, then quite clearly you could see that you would be wasting a lot of your fertilizers um, by scattering it throughout the field and not putting it directly where the root zone of the plants would be. Another method of application is ring placement. And this method is suitable for most vegetable plants and for young fruit trees as well. So basically what you're doing is you want to put a circular band um, around the drip circle of your plants. And this method is more suited for where you have a flat, um, flat topography. So I have some photos here. And these would show, um, if you look at them, you'll see the ring where the fertilizer is applied around the drip circle. And now the drip circle is basically when you irrigate or if the rain fall and the water drips off the edges of the leaves, at that area is called the drip circle. And that is where most of your feeding roots of your plants are. So that's the best area in which you want to apply your fertilizer. Now, these are some other photos um, showing the ring type placement of, uh, or of applying fertilizers. Another way in which you can apply fertilizer is through spot placement. This method is suitable for where you have crops that usually would have a very fast spacing. So um, you wouldn't do band placement or broadcasting because you'll be wasting a lot of your fertilizers. And it can be used for most vegetables and for fruit trees as well. And um, especially for home gardeners who grow plants in pots, then the spot placement um, method of application is suitable for you all. I have a photo on the screen here of a young citrus plant, and you can see where uh, the area is highlighted in red. 
you see um, fertilizers that were placed in spots around the drip region or the drip circle of that plant. Now for fruit trees, especially large fruit trees, one thing you can do also is you can make some small holes around the drip circle. You can put in the fertilizer into the hole and then cover them back. Now um, that would prevent your fertilizers from being um, wasted or leaching away. But when you talk about commercial, especially for vegetable production, digging a hole and covering the fertilizer is not a very practical um, thing to do. So the other photo would show a crop of cabbage and you'd see some spot placement of fertilizer there. Just imagine um, it is not uncommon for farmers to plant maybe 200 crates of cabbages. Um, if you have a 200 cell crate, so 200 by 200, that's roughly 40,000 plants. You're not going to be digging 40,000 holes to put fertilizer and cover it for commercial production. So for fruit trees, yeah, you can do that. Commercial vegetable production, it's not always practical. I have some other photos here of some other vegetable plants where you can see, um, and I have highlighted it in a red ring, uh, some spot placement of fertilizers. So spot placement, again, it's generally um, good for most vegetables and for fruit trees. Another method of uh, applying fertilizers would be using a semicircle uh, pattern. And this is similar to the ring application, except you're just doing a semicircle method. And this is suitable for, again, most vegetables and for young fruit trees. It is very appropriate for when you are doing hillside cultivation or when you are growing on undulating lands. And generally, what you want to do is put the fertilizer on the upper slope so that when you irrigate or when the rain falls, the nutrient would leach into the root zone of your plant and not away from the root zone. It's a little bit difficult to tell um, from the photo, but this photo here um, is of a hot pepper plant, and this plant is actually grown on a steep slope. So by applying the fertilizer to the upper side of the slope, the fertilizer, the nutrients, will be able to wash into or get into the, the root zone of your plants. Another method of applying fertilizer is through what we call foliar application. And these are suitable, this method of application is suitable for, um, as a supplement for your granular fertilizer. And the, this is where you would use fertilizers that are soluble. So once the ones that are in the form of crystalline or liquid concentrate, you would dilute them in water according to the manufacturer's recommendation again and you would apply them to the leaves or the foliage of your plant. The plants would then absorb them and translocate the nutrients within the plant. This is a very good method for if you need to apply micronutrients because some of them are not very mobile. And if you fully apply them, you can get them to the, as close as possible to where the plants would require them most. It is also a good option for crops that have a lot of biomass. So in the later stages, if you want to do some additional fertilizing um, for crops such as sweet potatoes and pumpkins and cucumbers and watermelon, that it would be a little bit difficult to find where the roots are or the root zone are. You can do some foliar fertilizing as a supplemental um, addition of fertilizers. So I have some photos here of um, foliar fertilizers being sprayed onto the foliage of the plant or the leaves of the plant and again, it is very important to follow the dilution rate on the label because I have um, on the screen, if you look at the leaves, you would see some symptoms of damage. And this is basically due to um, the fertilizer being too concentrated and you have that burning again taking place. In some instances, what happens is that the um, fertilizers that are not completely dissolved, they remain in suspension. And um, that is why it's important to constantly agitate. If you do tank mixing, you want to constantly agitate before you refill your sprayer so that you don't have the uh, fertilizer settling at the bottom. And then whenever you spray your last can, then you have the phytotoxic um, damage taking place. Another method of um, apply applying fertilizers is through what we call fertigation. And this is for when you grow your crops through drip irrigation or through hydroponics. And usually what happens is that you would want to uh, inject the fertilizer 
into your irrigation system. And I have a photo coming up in the next slide that will show you how you can do that. Uh, again, care must be taken when you're using this type of um, uh, method of apl applying fertilizers, especially when you mix the fertilizers, because when you mix certain chemicals together, you can have what you call a precipitate, a chemical reaction that takes place. It forms a, a precipitate that can clog up all your emitters. So the nutrients um, that, that would precipitate, you don't want to have that precipitation happening because whenever the, the, you have that chemical reaction, the nutrients then is lost and they are no longer available to your plants. So this is a photo here um, of what you have on the left hand top photo. This is a, what you call a venturi, or this is how you would intake your um, nutrients into your irrigation line. If you look at the, the bottom, it will show you a venturi system. And, and basically what happened is that wherever you have a high, high pressure of water and then you have a restriction on the line, so you reduce the size of the line, you're going to have an increased velocity of the water. And that is going to create a, um, a suction effect. And the suction effect is where at uh, that area is where you're going to um, to pull in your fertilizer solution into your irrigation system. Just for some additional keynotes, um, always remember whenever you do, uh, whenever you apply fertilizer, water is very, very important because if you apply fertilizers to your plant as granules, your plant cannot do anything with the fertilizer. Your plant can only use fertilizer or take in the nutrients as a solution. So water is very important. Another thing to take note of is your timing. At specific um, times and the stages of your plants, you have different physiological um, things taking place. So for example, if you grow sweet potato or cassava, you would find that um, at between four to six weeks is when your plants would normally form the tuberous roots. Um, so that would help guide you in terms of when you want to fertilize with what particular fertilizer. Also, in terms of when your plants begin to flower, you don't want to wait until your plants start um, developing fruits to add fertilizers that are high in potassium. At flower initiation is when you want to start applying fertilizers that are higher in potassium. And then there's also what we call pre-plant fertilizer, um, which you can add even at land preparation. So you can plow into your soil fertilizers um, when you're doing your land preparation. And one reason why you would want to do that um, is because some of these fertilizers, for example, phosphorus is not very mobile in the soil. So if you plow it in, you get the fertilizer distributed within the plant root zone and your plant is better able to um, utilize these fertilizers or nutrients. Uh, the last key note that we want to mention today is um, safety. Um, of course, a lot of times we would overlook the use of PPE or personal protective equipment, especially when it comes to fertilizing. Sometimes um, we would consider it a little bit with the whenever we are using pesticide, but um, whenever we use fertilizers, a lot of times we don't really consider it. Um, I know a lot of us do not read the labels on the fertilizers, but they do have a lot of um, a lot of information on the label. I have a clip here, a photo that I took of a fertilizer, and the label will give you a lot of information in terms of warning. Things like um, do not eat or drink or smoke whenever you're applying the, um, the fertilizer. Keep away from children. Um, in this particular one, the label even says that there's no specific antidote. And, um, you know, so things to take note of. Um, a lot of times when we look at the fertilizer label, what we're looking at is the content of it. So we're looking to see how much NP and K it have, and we don't pay attention to the safety aspect of it. This is another photo of a different fertilizer. And if you look at all the photos at the bottom, you would see a lot of warning um, symbols. So keep out of reach of children, wear goggles, wear your gloves, your mask, your boots. These are things that you would normally see on pesticide labels. So um, it's often overlooked whenever we talk about applying fertilizers. 
I have another uh, photo here of the label of another uh, fertilizer package. And this one, you will see the big danger symbol there. And under the danger symbol, you have um, warnings in seven different languages. Uh, those are granular fertilizers. The uh, liquid ones also do have a lot of um, a lot of warnings in them. Um, so you could see the symbols there at the bottom, the danger symbols, and then you see uh, other additional notes in terms of the how harmful the, the uh, product would be if you um, swallow it, and the um, the effects that it would have on you. Right. So. Always remember, um, it may not always be very comfortable to use PPE, and um, it may not always seem practical to you whenever you are applying fertilizers, but wherever possible, we do recommend the use of um, personal protective equipment even when you are applying fertilizers. So that brings us to the end of our session today, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank um, our corporate communications department and our IT personnel who are working behind the scenes to make this um, session a success. And we'd like to thank um, my colleague before, Mr. Rishi Mohan Singh, for his part of the presentation. And also we'd like to thank you all the um, persons who are tuning in. Uh, we want to remind you that if you have any questions, feel free to put them on the chat and we will try to address them as soon as possible on Facebook. So until next time, stay safe guys and take care.